A young man returns home and discovers on the carpet in the living room his own body. Next to it lies an envelope with the inscription, Look at me. The initial shock is replaced by curiosity as Alex finds a flash drive in the envelope, which he immediately plugs into his computer and on the screen sees just himself. The second Alex reassures himself he is not high and has not gone insane and advises to listen carefully. Thus, it all started with men in black coming to his house. Rebecca, an employee of a private scientific research institute of advanced technologies which cooperates with the National Security Agency of the USA, has a very tempting offer for Alex. But first, Alex must sign non-disclosure agreement, for which Rebecca offers a check for a substantial amount. Having signed the papers, Alex learns the story of an American unregistered satellite which the USA did not launch. Strangely enough, to admit, the satellite is allegedly from the future and contains a coded message inside. If Alex agrees, he will be put to sleep and delivered to the laboratory. The Institute knows that he is practically bankrupt and lives in a house inherited from his parents. To prove the seriousness of her intentions, Rebecca immediately transfers a large sum to Alex's account, which convinces him to sign the documents. The next day, he is put in a car, given an injection, after which he falls asleep and only comes to his senses in a closed, secret place. Rebecca shows him the laboratory where the satellite is already located. And the guy starts solving the task. Five weeks pass, but there are no results yet. Rebecca suggests Alex take a day off, but the guy does not need it. One day he is visited by a vision in which a young woman decodes the same task. After that, Alex bleeds from his nose. Later he finds the name of this woman written on the frame of the bed. Soon, Alex manages to decrypt part of the code, which contains drawings of an unknown device. Rebecca announces the end of his work and informs him that he will be taken home. Alex comes to his senses at home late at night. He feels ill, which he attributes to fatigue and stress. But after a few days, the malaise intensified, and he began to be haunted by persistent hallucinations. And one day, two strange-looking men appear on the threshold of his house, wanting to know why he agreed to decrypt the code. Alex does not understand because decryption is just his job, which pays well. The men continue to press Alex with questions about morality. Don't the consequences of his work bother him since the device to be created from the decrypted drawings will be the most powerful weapon in the world? Alex's head starts to hurt and he asks the men to leave. They thank him for the answers and leave. Alex immediately feels better and sits down at the computer. But at that moment, a call comes from Rebecca, reminding him of the signed non-disclosure agreements. An indignant Alex realizes that the Institute is watching him, and when he again sits down at the computer in his house, the lights go out. Alex goes outside and suddenly sees one of the two men who came to him with questions on the opposite side of the street. But the man's body starts growing before his eyes. Frightened, Alex runs home and looks out the window to see the giant's hand reaching for his window. Alex extends his hand to meet it and morning comes. Rebecca, who has arrived, finds Alex at work. He tries to explain that humanity lives in two-dimensional space and his recent guests are a highly developed civilization that exists not only in space but also in time. They can be in this room but earlier or later and they can watch what is happening through some kind of window in time. Alex tries to convey to Rebecca the danger of the device they are building, which can start World War III. Then the woman informs him that she knows about his illness, a brain tumor. The guy blames the Institute, which placed him in a room with a radioactive satellite, causing a tumor to develop in his brain and insists on stopping the construction of the device. Alex, in the present, pulls his dead body out of the house and buries it in the forest, then returns to the computer and continues to listen to the story from his future self. Alex in the future regrets that they did not want to listen to him because he understood that something ominous was coming. Then he remembers the woman. She is cryptographer. Alex finds her address, but Beth refuses to talk to him. Alex shouts that he is dying. He has six months left. After that, Beth opens the doors and informs that she has two years left. She also realized that it was a weapon and the drawing supposedly came from the future. There is another person, Schieferman, who communicates with her through the computer and sends her tasks, which she solves when she feels normal. Beth starts feeling unwell, so a man takes her to the bedroom, while he goes downstairs, where it seems like he sees the girl's life in the mirrors. There she is, saying goodbye to her beloved in military uniform. There his comrades inform her of terrible news, and there she is with a handful of pills in her hand, trying to leave this life. But then his attention is captured by a message from Schieferman appearing on the computer monitor. 
Alex responds, but Schieferman quickly realizes that it's not Beth and disconnects. The man then grabs a pack of printed papers with tasks previously given by Schieferman. In the morning, Beth finds him on her sofa with the papers glued together. The guy points out to her that all this are pieces of a puzzle which when assembled can give an answer. Schieferman clearly doesn't work at the Institute. Alex asks Beth to help stop the creation of a death machine. The girl reports that she fell ill specifically after working with the satellite. She started having hallucinations and began thinking about a message from the future. What if it's possible to contact the sender? She began to hear the voices of the dead and one day heard her own voice. She also saw aliens, though she doesn't believe in them, and asks Alex to leave. Alex goes home, where people in black are waiting for him. Rebecca orders him not to meet with Beth anymore and urges him to use the remaining time wisely. Angered, the guy sends the guests to hell and upon entering the house discovers that all his papers with conclusions have disappeared. Meanwhile, Beth sees a bright light at her house, which makes her feel sick. The woman screams in fear and tries to hide. Alex tries to drown his thoughts in alcohol when a message from Shefferman arrives on his computer. The guy is sure that Rebecca is hiding behind this nickname, but the interlocutor denies it. At that moment, the doorbell rings. Beth is on the threshold. It turns out that Shefferman directed Beth here and sent her the blueprints of a device capable of destroying the technology from the future. The couple begins developing a virus capable of destroying the machine being created from the blueprints they decrypted through the computer. But the next morning, Rebecca bursts into Alex's house. Representatives of the Institute know about their work and are already on their way there. She gives the name of the Institute's founder and orders to go to him as soon as possible. She is Shefferman and hoped to destroy the device with their help. Then cars approach Alex's house. The couple escapes through the back exit. Rebecca is caught, given an injection, and thrown into a car. Meanwhile, all the gas burners in the kitchen are opened. In the evening, Alex and Beth arrive at scientist Miles, who immediately recognizes both of them, as he has always followed their work. The thing is, this satellite was not the only one. There was another, which orbited Earth for about 400 years. Apparently, unknown beings from the future were waiting for Earthlings to grow up, fly into space, and be able to decrypt their message. The ancient satellite also contained blueprints of a machine, whose purpose was to limit the evolution of humanity within the third dimension. But when Miles announced his discovery, he was laughed at. He also developed a tumor, luckily not fatal. He is sure that aliens are capable of existing in several dimensions. They do not perceive time in a linear form as humans do. And the second device, which is now being created at the Institute, will likely provide them access to the human dimension. So far they are like watching a videotape where humans are movie characters. With the help of the first device, they can watch this movie, but cannot change what is happening. But the second will allow changing the existing reality. Miles is just beginning to understand the essence of this process, but cannot explain everything completely. After all, even the appearance of the aliens is formed by the human brain itself. And by the way, he has been in contact with a huge alien visible only to him, living in his garden for more than 30 years. Miles constantly looks at it, causing his brain to adapt and begin to see the true appearance of the humanoid. But his guests see no one. Miles is sure that the tumor in their heads is the alien's help so that people could perceive their reality. Alex suggests simply smashing the device with a hammer, but where is the guarantee that they will not restore it in the Institute? So all data on the server needs to be erased, although no one even knows the location of the Institute. But Miles reminds that he is one of its founders, and he pulls out a map with a detailed plan of the Institute. At that moment, a loud bang is heard at the door. The couple runs away, while Miles tries to calm down the raging alien. Alex and Beth hit the road and soon find the Institute's building, where they open a hatch through which they sneak inside. There they separate, to increase the chances of finding the laboratory. Alex witnesses the strange behavior of a guard who constantly returns backward and realizes that time inside the Institute is looped. Beth also falls into this loop. Realizing the futility of her attempts to go further, the girl activates the bomb. But because of the time loop, she is unable to leave the dangerous place. Alex goes into a dark room and tries to carry the bomb further when he is overtaken by an alien and literally disintegrates the man into small particles. A minute later, Alex finds himself tied to a table. Opposite him sits a humanoid. Alex thinks he has died, but the alien denies his belief. 
They are simply curious about the human appearance and their experience of time. Linear time for aliens is incomprehensible and tedious, a labor-intensive cycle of empty beliefs. Humans are like in a trap, forced to constantly go through the same thing. Aliens, on the other hand, exist outside of time and space. They are in every moment. Therefore, causal connection and sequence of actions for them is a mystery. What will happen if a human no longer has to wait for something? Alex realizes humans will become similar to the appearance of aliens, but the familiar personality of the ego dies in the moment. The alien is surprised. Death is natural, but man hides and distances himself from it. Time determines everything for a human. It is both a giver and a thief. A human sees the world as he imagined it, and what will happen when the source of projection disappears. Even with the eternity of self-analysis, man will not understand the difference between reality and illusion. With each newly born, a new reality comes. Therefore, a person always stands before a choice. Alex feels very bad. And then the alien offers to return to the moment before the guy got sick, with the information he now has. Alex decides that he would not have gone to work at the Institute and would have stopped all this. The alien is surprised. Why would he change his behavior if he's not able to change the situation? And then Alex admits, people do not choose what will happen. The humanoid insists, will his return to the past make a difference? Can something change? And immediately, the guy finds himself in his home, in front of the computer. He records this flash drive, realizing that nothing can be changed. The world may disappear tomorrow, but this is not news. Everything has already happened. Everything ended before it began. He puts the flash drive in an envelope and falls to the floor. The last words on the flash drive are about Alex in the past, warning Beth and he drives to the girl's house, while Alex from the future, in his last words, asks to forget about everything and live on. Quite an interesting movie that makes you think, what if the concept of time really does not exist, and we live only here and now, in one single moment? Who made us believe that there is a past and a future? And is it true that a person does foolish things, not thinking about how his thoughts and actions change his own future? Friends, write your opinion in the comments, 